Let me pray and we'll get started. Father, thank you for your faithfulness. You're an amazing God. And it's always such a, a, an opportunity to come into your presence and worship you in spirit and in truth. And we're so grateful and thankful for all that you do in our lives. I pray, God, your continued favor and blessings would be upon Northview, and certainly I pray that your blessing and favor would be upon CJ and his leadership, and, and God, I pray that for every church throughout this community that's teaching about your amazing love, I pray that your blessings would be upon them as well. God, as we get into this, open up our eyes and ears to see and hear all that you want to do in our life. We love you and praise you, and we just ask it in the name of Jesus, Amen. Have you ever been anxious for a letter to show up? I don't know, maybe it was a bonus check, maybe it was a college acceptance letter, maybe your spouse is in the military and you're waiting to hear from them. But every day you go out and check the mailbox to see if that letter's arrived. You try to be patient, but my gosh, it seems like it's taking forever. I mean, I see why they call it snail mail. And then finally, the letter shows up, it arrives, and there's this sense of relief and then you open it, and it's exactly what you've been hoping for. Good news. Words so encouraging that you not only read it once, but you read it a second time, and then a third time. And then you want it to be an encouragement to your friends and your family, and so you give it to them so they can read it as well. You see, I think, friends, I think that's what the first century Christians were feeling as they read this letter. Now, I'm not sure they had mailboxes, so I'm not sure they sat by any mailbox waiting on it. And honestly, I'm not sure they even knew this letter was coming. But I'm telling you, when it arrived, it was so encouraging to them. I'm confident immediately they read this to the entire congregation several times, and then I'm sh they began to share it with other churches as well. Last week, uh, CJ started our series in Revelation, and he read to you chapter one, verse three, that says, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. See, for years I've heard people say, I don't like Revelation. It's just kind of frightening, it's intimidating, and I just stay away from it. And yet, guys, it's the only book with a promise to be blessed for those who read it. It's a book that you want to be in. It was never supposed to be intended to be scary or frightening. It was intended to be a book of encouragement and hope. And so that's one of the reasons we're in, the, in this book right now. I mean, guys, this was a person, think about it. This was a personal message from God. So even if God was correcting them, it still filled them with all kinds of hope. We're looking for those of you that are guests, we're looking at the seven letters written to the seven churches in Asia Minor. John had been exiled to Patmos. You realize he's the only disciple that wasn't martyred for his faith. Uh, the story goes, true or not, we really don't know, but the story goes they tried to kill John, but he wouldn't die, and so they exiled him uh, to Patmos. And he, Jesus, he has this vision, this revelation, and so the book, again, is not revelations, it is revelation. He has this revelation from God, and he sees Jesus, and Jesus tells him to write down this vision, this revelation, word for word. So if you have a red-letter Bible, you'll notice that all of this is written in red. And I, through the years, I've had people push back and say, this shouldn't be in red. These are not the words of Jesus. Oh, yes, they are. He wrote them exactly as Jesus dictated them to him. So in chapter 1, verse 19, uh, Jesus instructs him. He says, write, therefore, what you have seen, past, what is now, what's going on right now, and what will take place later. So that's what Revelation is about. God tells John to write. He wants the message to the seven churches to be clear. Because guys, these are real people. Please realize that. Sometimes I think we read about them and it, it's just like some spiritual story. But these are real people. They had families. They had jobs. And they were going through an extremely difficult time. I know some of you are as well. There are many in the room that would say, well, I'm going through a difficult time and I get that. But their difficult time was one of persecution. It was intense persecution, like, like we have never experienced ourselves. So these letters were exactly what they needed to hear. It gave them the assurance that no matter how difficult things had become, God is a good God that absolutely loves them. 
And God is a God that's in control. And guys, here's the thing. The same is true today. The same is true for you and for me. No matter how bad things get, we need to be reminded that of God's goodness and God's control. Now, you may have been here a few years ago. I did a series and I used these two white pillars as an illustration and it bears repeating. And I believe that seriously, I don't wanna overstate it. And yet at the same time, I believe that if you get a hold of what I'm gonna tell you in this, it's a, it can be a spiritual aha moment where you're like, oh my gosh, I get it. And it can be a changing experience with your faith. So imagine these two pillars, this one says goodness. And this is picture the goodness of God, that God is still on the throne. And no matter what you see on television and how bad things get and how many wars are taking place, we still have a God that is on the throne and in charge, in control. Then, or excuse me, I got that backwards, in control. Goodness, God is a good God that absolutely loves us, that no matter how many mistakes you've made, no matter how you blow it, he loves you. And so the point that I want you to see is that as long as I stand between these two white pillars, then contentment and faith and peace are gonna rise in my life. That no matter what happens to me, I'm okay, because I know God's got this. The problem becomes in the church, the problem becomes with believers when we step outside these two pillars. So if I step out here and I say, you know, I believe God's on the throne, I believe he's in control, but man, I've made so many mistakes. I don't know if he loves me or not, loves me or not. Well, what's gonna happen? Well, all of a sudden this peace and contentment are gonna go down and fear and worry and anxiety are gonna go up. And even though we're Christians, we're gonna live with that tension. Or maybe it's over here and I say, well, I know that God's a good God and I know that he loves me, but man, have you seen the news lately? I mean, there's wars everywhere. There's rumors of wars and things are rough. You know, and so I just don't know if I believe he's on the throne anymore. Fear, worry, and anxiety are gonna go up. Peace and contentment are gonna go down. And that's why we have to say, the Bible tells us without faith, it's impossible to please God. Not hard, not difficult, it's impossible. God's looking for us to live a life of faith. What does that mean? That means I stand between these two pillars and I believe he's a good God and I believe he's in control. And yes, there's gonna be things that happen to me I don't understand. And yet at the same time, I don't get it. I don't know why I'm going through this, but I know God's got this and I know he loves me. And I know that he's promised in scripture that he's gonna work all things together for the good of those that love him. Now, I know that there's some of you that are discouraged right now. Things have not gone at all how you hoped they would. Or maybe you're not where you should be in your walk with the Lord. Then you've got to determine to build your faith on these two pillars. It's got to be, listen, it's not going to happen because you just woke up, right? Or you put a Bible under your pillow. It's got to be an intentional thing where you say, you know what? Uh, I'm not living if the peace and the joy that God promised. Why is that? Because I'm not standing between those two pillars. And so one of the reasons why I love the book of Revelation is because it reminds me of these two pillars. But guys, at the same time, that's why Satan will do whatever he can to discourage the church from reading this book. Hear me on that. Satan's gonna do whatever he can to discourage you from reading the book of Revelation. But God intended for Revelation to be a blessing to the church, a book of hope and a book of anticipation for what lies ahead for each one of us. Okay, so there was a lot of other churches, not just these seven churches, but there was a lot of other churches. And so we wonder why these seven. I have no idea. Only God knows why he selected these seven churches but I know the message was for all believers, not just back then when he wrote it to that specific church, but for us today. Now, some theologians, and I'm not gonna get into all this right now, but some theologians believe that these seven churches are in a specific order because their characteristics are in successive eras of church history. I happen to believe that's true. Uh, and again, that's a whole nother teaching to get into. I do believe they're in a specific order. If it's true, then the last one, Laodicea, is the, where we are right now, the period that we're in right now. And it would represent 
where we are. I don't know for sure that it represents different church eras, but we do know this much. They were seven very real churches, and each letter had a very specific message for each one of those congregations. And they were then circulated and intended to be read by others as well. Jesus repeatedly extended an appeal for all of us to hear. You know, sometimes we read and we, we read without really giving it thought. But if you read this book and really try to comprehend everything you're reading, you'll see there's specific messages for us. Jesus repeatedly extended an appeal for us to hear or listen. It's like Jesus is saying, you need to hear me. Church, you need to hear what it is that I'm saying to you. Guys, we get so preoccupied with our everyday life that we often miss what Jesus is trying to show us. And it's like, okay, so I'm gonna stay focused on Jesus, but then over here, I've got my life, I've got my failures, I've got my disappointments, I've got my struggles going on, and I let these things get in front of me and God. And so now, instead of looking at God, my focus is on all my failures and struggles and all the hurts that are going on. Guys, that's why prayer is essential in our spiritual life. It's not an option, it's essential. Because what does prayer do? Prayer gets me refocused on Jesus again. That's really the main purpose. It's to keep us focused. So why? So that we can hear him. Jesus knows exactly where you are. He knows exactly what it is that you need. And that's true for the big C church, the church of Jesus Christ, as well as the little C church, which of course would be Northview. He knows what Northview needs because it's his church. And the truth of the matter is we are his people. So he starts each letter with the words of encouragement and praise. He says, I know, I know. In other words, nothing gets past Jesus. I know what's going on in your life. I know about your successes. I know about your failures. I know the hurts that you're experiencing. I know your shortcomings. And I know exactly what it is that you need. Satan, on the other hand, wants to convince you that God doesn't care about you. See, I, 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 hear, I hear people all the time say, I just, I don't know if I really believe God cares about me or if God loves me. That's not coming from your own thoughts. You do know that, right? That's coming from Satan who is a liar. Jesus said he is the father of lies. And he's whispering in your ear, I've said this before, but let me say it again. You're gonna hear three voices in your life. You're gonna hear your own consciousness. You're gonna hear the Holy Spirit whispering in your ear, and you're gonna hear the lies of the enemy. If you're hearing more than those three voices, you really need to seek out help, but that's, <laughs> that really is another conversation. But you're gonna hear those three voices, and you've gotta determine which you're listen to, listening to. And so that's why it's imperative that you know the truth. Because if you believe his lies, you're gonna respond accordingly. He's gonna whisper in your ear, why do you even go to church? Why do you follow him? Do you not know that God really doesn't care about you? I mean, think about how many people in the world, God doesn't know you. Why? Without faith, it's impossible to please God. So Satan spends all of his time trying to do what? Shake your faith. And then notice at the close of each letter in this, his appeal for us to hear, to hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So yes, these letters were specific to each church, but that same message and promise and warning is also for each and every church today, right now. And two of the churches that we're gonna look at in this series, two of the churches, Smyrna and Philadelphia, he only gives words of praise. To the other churches, Sardis and Laodicea, he only had words of correction. The other three, Ephesus, Pergamum, and Thyatira, he has kind of mixed comments on their spiritual progress uh, and some of the things that they needed corrected on. Today, as I said, we're gonna look at Ephesus. Now, if you pull up a map, you'll discover that the city of Ephesus is located where Turkey is today. So this is modern day Turkey, and it's also where the seven churches of Asia Minor were located. You see the seven churches right there. 
while Pergamum was the capital of the Roman province of Asia, Ephesus actually was the most important city. They had a population of more than 250,000 people. They were a major commercial, political, and religious power. It was home to the temple Diana, the goddess of sex and fertility. And people would literally come from all over, literally around the world to worship her. Of course, their idea of worship was illicit sex with temple prostitutes, as well as sexual orgies and sexual mutilation. So imagine being the church at Ephesus and you're trying to build a church. You're trying to reach a community. It was very difficult to thrive in this type of a culture. And that, of course, is where all the persecution came from. Paul founded the church and Timothy was the first pastor. So let's get started in the book of Ephesus, Revelation chapter two, verse one. He starts out and he says, to the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in the right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. The book of of Revelation is full of this type of imagery. And Bible scholars have argued for centuries about the meaning of some of these various symbols. Fortunately for us in chapter one, Jesus explains this particular image. The lampstand represents the seven churches and the Stars represent the messengers or angels or pastors of the seven churches. I tried to point out to Sandy one time, I said, see, I've been telling you that pastors are angels. And she didn't even smile. She said, you're no angel. (laughs) Notice Jesus says that he walks among the churches. You say, well, is that important? Do we need to pay attention to that? Absolutely. He wants us to know that he's always with us. He says, I walk among you. I know all the things that you do. Guys, I know there are times, again, that we all go through difficulties. I know there are times you have probably had these thoughts. You begin to wonder, where's God in this? I mean, this is hard. This is difficult. Where is God in all of this? But you need to be reminded that the scripture, the scripture promises us that he'll never leave you or forsake you. The scripture makes it clear that not only is he with you, but he wants to be in a relationship with you. Friends, that's the reason we worship him. That's the reason we gather together to worship him. It's why we pray to him. It's why we should want to emulate him. You read the New Testament and you see that what, what scripture is looking for, what Uh, God is looking for is that we would emulate Jesus. It's why it's so important that we're obedient to everything that he's asked us to do. I'll promise you guys, nothing happens in your life that he doesn't know about. Nothing happens that he doesn't know about. Let's look at verse two. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. There it is again. I know your deeds. Jesus gives the church, this particular church at Ephesus, a little pat on the back for two things actually. He gives them a pat on the back for their deeds and he gives them a pat on the back for their doctrine. He calls them hard workers because they're willing to get their hands dirty. They're willing to serve other people. They're willing to serve their own neighbors. They understand, and this is important church because we need to understand this as well. They understand that every one of us, if you're a believer, we are all ministers and we have a responsibility to do the work of a minister. Paul tells us that in Ephesians chapter two, he says, for we believers, all believers, for we are God's handiwork and we were created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Before you were ever, before you were ever out of your mother's womb, God knew you and he had a purpose and a plan for your life. And we were created to do good works. Friends, we need to be reminded that Jesus knows our thoughts. He knows our attitude, whether good or bad, he knows all about it. Do you understand that he's, he's watching how we behave? 
You know, so oftentimes we, we're so worried about what everybody else sees or what everybody else thinks about us. And then we kind of get alone by ourselves, and we do some things in secret and think, whew, I'm glad nobody knows about that. Well, he does. The only one that really matters knows. He sees what we read. He knows what we watch. He knows what we say and how we're living our life. In this case, Jesus, he was pleased by the way they were living their life. Unfortunately, most churches in America are dying today because their, their people are not engaged in the work of the ministry. You know, I, I said to you that a lot of the churches I've been speaking in are growing and God's doing something special there, and it's true. But the biggest percentage of churches in America are dying. They're not growing. And the reason is, is because their people have slowly drifted away from the gifts and the talents they're not engaged in the work of ministry anymore. They've become spectators observing from the sideline. But here in Ephesus, the people were engaged in the work of the ministry and they were helping the hurting and reaching those that were far from God. Northview, that is certainly my hope for each one of you. That as you read the book of Revelation, that it'll ignite something in you, that you'll begin to see God wants to use me. That it'll motivate you to use the gifts and talents. So, so often people say, I don't have any gifts, Steve. I'm just not a very talented person. That's a lie of the enemy. You're listening to the wrong voice because God again knew you before you were ever born and he has given you gifts and talents that he wants you to use for the kingdom of God. Listen, guys, there's around 10,000 of us on all of our campuses that gather each and every week. Imagine if we all decided we were gonna engage with our God-given talents and we were gonna find a way to serve the Lord. We would have an amazing impact, not just on our city, but on the state of Indiana, on the, on the US and around the world. So Jesus also commended them for their doctrine. He said they refused to, they refused to tolerate evil and they tested the claims of the false teachers against the word of God. Oh my goodness, friends, hear me please. I am so concerned, my great, if you say as a pastor, what, what would your greatest concern be? My greatest concern is how many Christians today are not reading the word of God. I mean, bar none, that's the thing that concerns me more than anything else, why? Because Satan is a liar. And how in the world will you know that you're being lied to if you don't know the truth? Do you know there's around 2 billion Christians in the world today, and statistics say 80% of those, 2 billion, 80% never open their Bible except in church. That is frightening. I'm not trying to make anybody feel guilty at all. I'm just trying to say it is essential that we read the word so we know the truth. If you don't, the enemy will lie to you and deceive you. It's like if I said, if I came to you and I said, hey, I just wanted you to know that your spouse was in a horrible car wreck and it doesn't look like they're gonna make it, they've taken them to the hospital. Immediately, fear and panic would rise and you would just, your only thought would be, how can I get to the hospital the fastest? But then somebody else comes over to you and they say, he is a liar. Your spouse is right out there. There's nothing wrong with them. Well, immediately, your emotions calm down, don't they? Because you discovered that was a lie. You might have the emotion of anger at me, but you calm down because you discover that's a lie. You are gonna respond according to what you believe is truth. And if, say, yeah, if Satan convinces you that uh, something is truth and the scripture clearly tells us it's not, you're gonna respond accordingly. You have to get in the word of God to protect yourself from the lies of the enemy. Jesus told us he is the father of lies. He's gonna do whatever he can to destroy your faith and he's gonna do it through lying. You know, um, if you've ever been to Yellowstone National Park, and I'm sure many of you have, you've seen those signs around, they've got them different ones at different places that says, don't feed the bears. I, we had one example. Don't feed the bears. Well, I was reading this article and it said, most people think that those signs are for our protection, but actually they're for the protection of the bears. 
because each year, the more friendly bears end up getting food all summer long from park visitors. Then when the tourist season is over, some of the bears die because they've forgotten how to feed themselves. Church, have you forgotten how to feed yourself? Friends, you can't depend on your pastor to feed you. You can't depend on a podcast to feed you. You can't depend on your parents to feed you. You can't depend on some TV preacher to feed you. You've got to feed yourself if you're gonna survive the lies of the enemy. Thomas Jefferson once wrote, he said, I've always said and always will say that the studious perusal of the Holy Scriptures will make better citizens, better fathers, better husbands. The Bible makes the best people in the world. Wasn't Thomas Jefferson a wise guy? I think he's absolutely right. The Ephesians gathered, on, gathered together on a regular basis to hear the word of God and pray. We gather once a week. They gathered daily. I mean, they were sharing meals together. They were coming together daily. They made worship a priority, even when they didn't feel like it. They obeyed the word of God. They were not giving in to sexual sin or explosions of anger. They loved their children and they raised their children in the admonition of the Lord. Guys, there's just something to be said for Christians who faithfully day after day after day just do what God's called us to do. And that, my friends, is why we need to know the word of God and determine that we're gonna live our life, that the word of God is gonna become the foundation of our faith and that we're gonna live by it. Well, I'm not sure at this point of the letter, uh, the people of Ephesus, I'm sure, were feeling pretty good about themselves. It's kind of like, yeah, what he said. You know, they, they were excited about it. And then they get to verse four, or that's part of the letter that says, yet, but, I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. He says, you know what? You've worked hard and you've been persevering and you've not tolerated evil. But, you know, one of the things we know about the English language is that after the but, often comes the painful truth. So when you hear somebody say, you know, that was a great meal, but, or uh, that's a pretty dress, but, or here's one I'm really familiar with. That was a really good sermon, but God says, you know what, you've done, you've done, hear me, you have done some good things. And see, here's a problem, church. We oftentimes think, okay, if I do enough good deeds, God will be pleased with me. And we think it's all about works. We think if I make a list and I, I go to church on the weekend and I go to the, this visitation or I go to this project they're doing, if I do these things, then God's pleased with me. But he says, this is what I hold against you. You don't love me or one another as much as you first did. Somewhere along the way, he's saying your love for me has grown cold. You've become apathetic and different toward the things of God. You see, guys, what God is interested in is not the, the things that you've done and the list you make and check off. I've done all these things. What God is interested in is your heart because he knows if you fall in love with me, he's saying, I know everything else will fall in place. If I'm your priority, if I'm the most important thing in your life, you're just gonna to wanna to please me and you'll serve me. You won't even think about it. You won't worry about checking off a list. You'll just do it because you love me. Listen, guys, there's more than 600 Old Testament commandments and a Jewish boy before he's 12 had to memorize these commandments. And one day a Pharisee asked Jesus, he said, okay, so what's the most important commandment? And Jesus' response is classic. In Matthew chapter 22, he says, Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second, by the way, you didn't ask for two, but the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. He said, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So Jesus said, I know there's 600 commandments, but I'm telling you the most important one is love God with everything within your being. And if you do that and love your neighbor as yourself, if you do that, you'll do all the rest of them. You don't need to worry about the rest of them. Christians, do we understand that more than anything else, Jesus wants to be in a relationship with us? 
For those of you, probably the best example, for those of you that are married, you remember how in love you were when you first got married. Oh my gosh. You know, it's, it's who you thought about at night before you fell asleep. It's, it's who you were thinking about in the morning when you got out of bed. You were passionate about your love for them. You would talk about them to everybody. You want everybody to know about this person and just how wonderful they were. You know, it's like if I, when Sandy and I were dating in high school, it was like if we weren't together, we were on the phone talking to each other. You know, and it's like I talked about her to everybody. You know, I was, I was over the moon for this girl. I was attentive to their needs as we are. You know, we, we love spending time together. But then with a lot of couples, something happens. You know, they get married and life is wonderful and they're so in love and it's always going to be this way. And then something starts to happen. Neglect, apathy, indifference. You begin to take your spouse for granted. Oh, you don't talk to each other as much as you used to. You stop putting their needs before your own. You no longer make the effort to keep this relationship special. You just don't trust them like you once did. And before you know it, you just don't care as much. And if you're honest, you don't feel the way you once did. And you've become indifferent about the relationship. Listen, guys, when that happens, you do understand we all see it. We all could tell you where this relationship is headed. Don't you all know that family and friends where you'll see a couple that was once so in love and, and you can see they're drifting apart. You can see the indifference that's taken place. And you might say to your spouse, they're not gonna make it. Unless something changes, they're just not gonna make it. Well, guys, the same thing is true with our relationship with Jesus. You used to be so in love with him. You thought about him all the time. You wanted your friends to meet him and experience what you've experienced. But for a lot of different reasons, you've kind of neglected him and you just don't feel it anymore. And now all of a sudden, even your friends are saying, man, I don't know what's going on with them spiritually, but they're not gonna make it if something doesn't change. They've kind of walked away from that first love. And of course, we quickly push back and say, Steve, you know, that's easy for you to say, but come on, life is hectic. You know, my, my, I've got kids now and they're involved in all these activities and I'm trying to get a promotion at work and I just have so many other things that need to happen. So it's just not the priority it used to be. So what did Jesus tell them they needed to do? In verse five, he says, consider how far you have fallen. Repent, repent, and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Not only does he tell them what they need to do, but he then, he then gives them a pretty strong warning of what's gonna happen if they don't do it. He says, the first thing you need to do is you just need to stop right where you're at and you need to think about it. You need to remember what you felt when you first discovered a relationship with Jesus. You see, again, guys, this isn't just gonna happen. It's gonna take you being intentional saying, I just need to stop and think about it. I realize spiritually I'm not where I used to be. What's happened here? Why am I not where I used to be? He wants us, listen, he wants us to, to recall the love and the emotion we once felt for him, to remember what it was like when our love for him motivated everything we did. It's why we did what we did, because we just wanna serve the Lord. It's why we do what we do, because we're so in love with him and we want the rest of the world to experience, his, experience it as well. And once we've remembered, Jesus said, then you need to repent. Now, so often we think of the word repent as just saying, I'm sorry. That's not what the word really means. To repent is to change directions. To repent is to go 180 degrees the other way. To begin to do the, the task and take the actions that you once did before. He's telling us we need to get back to the relationship we once experienced with Jesus. To stop neglecting our relationship with God and once again, make Jesus the priority of our life. Did you once find time to pray? Then you need to find time again. Did you once have a daily devotion and a quiet time? Then you need to do it again. Guys, we need to fall in love with Jesus all over again. So remember, repent and return, because if you don't, he says he will remove your lampstand from its place. In other words, he's trying to warn them that if they ignore this and don't do anything about it, 
then you know what? Their light is going to burn out. And that's exactly what happened to the church at Ephesus. Exactly what he was warning them happened. There is no church, there is no work in Ephesus today. And all of this reminds me, all of this reminds me of the old couple driving down the, down the road and the wife turns to him and said, you remember when we used to sit close together and, and uh, snuggle as we drove and what happened? And he turns to her and he goes, I didn't move. <laughs> well, when you feel like your relationship is not what it used to be with Jesus, please remember, he didn't move. He didn't move. Verse six, it says, but you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which, also, which I also hate. Verse seven, whoever has ears, let them hear. He says that a lot. Whoever has ears, let him hear. In other words, you've got to hear me. What the Spirit says to the church is, to the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. He says, you hate the practices of the Nicolaitans. The Nicolaitans were basically a cult who taught impure doctrines and followed impure practices. Listen, friends, I believe with everything in my being that God loves all mankind. I believe that he loved the Nicolaitans. I believe that he loves every one of us. But it says he hates their practices. He hates their bad habits. Friends, God loves you and he loves me. But there may be some bad habits or practices in your life that he is not pleased with at all. Friends, you can't just do anything you want and think God's okay with it. Yes, we serve a God of grace and mercy who loves us and is very forgiving. And when we mess up, he stands with his arms open wide, ready to receive us. But you can't just live any way you want and think everything's gonna be okay in your life. Then Jesus closed the letter with a promise and a challenge for every believer who's willing to respond and obey. Most translations say, to him who overcomes. To him who overcomes. Well, who is the overcomer? Well, 1 John 5, 5 tells us. It says, who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. So if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God and you're following him, then friends, you are indeed an overcomer and you will spend all eternity with Jesus. But friends, as I bring this to a close, if you're a Christian, then I want you to be self-aware. If you're a Christian, then I want you to be honest with yourself and ask yourself, are you still in love with Jesus? Are you standing between those two pillars? Do you have that passionate, emotional, extravagant love for Jesus? Or has your heart kind of grown cold? Has the flame kind of burn itself out, then what do you need to do? You need to do the same thing he told the church at Ephesus. You need to repent and return to that same relationship. I'm gonna ask everyone, if you would, uh, bow your head for just a moment. No one looking around. But if you're a follower of Christ, if you're a believer, I just want you to be honest. And if you need to come back, if you need to come back to that first love, to fall in love with Jesus again. I wanna say a quick prayer for you and I'm just gonna ask you to raise your hand and then put it back down. Just raise it up and put it up and say, yes, Steve, pray for me, please. I need to come back to that first love. Yeah, thank you, all over the house. Father, thank you and praise you for your faithfulness. You're an amazing God. I thank you that you're long suffering and patient. I thank you, Lord, that even though we blow it, even though we make mistakes, even though we get selfish and self-centered and live for ourselves at times, the fact of the matter is, more than anything else, you just want our heart. You just want us to, for you to be a priority in our life. So I pray for everyone in this house, but especially those that raise their hand. Help us, God, to come back home. Help us, God, to return to our first love. Help us, God, to make the decision that you are going to be a priority in our life. Thank you, God. We love you and we praise you. Thank you for your patience. In Jesus' name, amen.